I used Roman numerals because they're fancy. My last video where I showed some of the more interesting setups I've had to do at work was surprisingly popular, so I thought I'd share a few more that I found on my computer. My day job is in a facilities machine shop at a university, and uh, we have all the trades represented, and in this case, the plumbing shop brought in this uh, piece of, uh, of piping that they made for one of the pools on campus. Now, whether they just didn't fit it quite right or pieces didn't go back together once they glued it all up, uh, whatever happened, the piece definitely did not fit where it was supposed to be, and they needed some shaved off of the gasket surfaces. In addition to already being glued up, uh, this was made more complicated by the fact that the light gray portion that you see is a separate piece that allows them to rotate that ring to line up with the bolt holes and what I needed to shave down was the dark gray portion in the middle. As you can see I've got it hanging off the edge of the table and I've got the ram turned so that I can actually reach the piece. This took a little bit of experimenting because I needed to make sure that I could travel all the way one direction without the plastic pipe hitting the knee of the mill. Basically my only option was to put a couple of bars on there that I could clamp the piece to and I just drilled holes through the bars to match the spacing of the T-slots on the table. I used some bolts and some wide washers to clamp the outer ring to the uh, middle section uh, just to keep it all stationary as much as possible and for the most part that was successful. Uh, afterwards I had to actually move those bolts over a couple of holes so that I could machine the rest of it. Coming back to the first picture for a second, I, uh, I actually had to do this to both of the faces that you can see, uh, the one that's set up there as well as the one below it at this 45 degree angle. That angle didn't cause any problems because it was just located on the bars, so it was nice and flat. Beyond this, uh, it was actually just a straightforward milling operation. I used a fly cutter and just uh, went straight across the face and got it all one level. Um, it really wasn't all that weird besides the strange setup. I do want to say that nobody in my shop is responsible for picking the color that this machine is painted. We got this from another shop on campus who had gotten it from the education building when they shut down their machine shop about 30 years ago. And uh, it sat stored for a while and uh, then it came to us, that color. Now on this one you may be thinking, Stuart, what gives? Uh, this is just step clamps. What's so weird about this? Well, if you notice in the back, those two step clamps are actually making a V-block and they're just clamped down to the table, not the part. This is a handy trick to use if you've got a lot of round pieces that you need to clamp directly down to the table and it just makes repeating that location very, very easy. In this case, I had, you guessed it, four pieces to do. A friend of mine from work was modifying uh, his car and I can't remember the particulars of this one. It, it's either a, a Lotus Elise or an old MG and he was changing out parts to a Mazda Miata. So in this case I needed to drill to a different bolt hole pattern for the wheels. Now even though I had that V-block made out of step clamps, I still wanted to make sure that bolt hole pattern was totally centered over the wheel, so I dialed in each piece individually. But the step clamps actually made it a little bit easier to do that just because I was already somewhere in the vicinity of zero. I also had to redrill the bolt pattern on the half shafts, and this shows another really handy technique. Uh, in this case, I had to hold it vertically, and I wanted to make sure that it was nice and perpendicular to the table, so I just took an extra lathe chuck, and it's always handy to have one of those around. I clamped that to the table, hanging off the edge, so that I could extend the half shaft down, and then, again, I dialed in each one individually to make sure that it was concentric to the half shaft. This is another instance where I needed to make sure that I actually had enough travel with the setup as it was because if, uh, if I moved over too far, the bottom of the half shaft would hit the saddle of the table. 
even if I'm not hanging it off the edge, it's always handy to have an extra chuck around for stuff like this. Uh, if you're not doing indexing, but you just need to hold a piece of round stock very firmly, a lathe chuck really can't be beat in a lot of cases. In addition to that, I also had to turn the turret on my machine just to make sure that I could actually reach my piece, and I had to crank the ram out a good ways as well since I was on the front of the table. 1990 was a big year. The Iron Curtain was metaphorically and physically crumbling, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. In addition, the university got this pretty cool sculpture. This sculpture is pretty interesting in and of itself. You have this large granite spire in the middle of the plaza here, and on the solstices and the equinoxes, it will cast its shadow on one of those three markers in front of it on the plaza. As part of the sculpture, there's this manhole cover that shows the key of where those shadows are supposed to fall depending on the day of the year. You can also use the sculpture to find the North Star by staring through the hole in the middle of the globe there in the foreground uh, at the top of the spire, and it'll point you right to Polaris. I pointed out that it's been there since 1990 because it took the university the better part of three decades to correct a glaring error in the casting of this manhole cover. The eagle-eyed among you will notice that this says spring and summer equinox instead of spring and autumnal equinox. There is no such thing as a summer equinox. And the engineering department and the university as a whole got complaints for 27 years about this wording before they finally decided to fix it. To fix this, we got the correct wording cast into a separate piece, which uh, was bigger than what we needed, so we're going to machine this down later. And then I just machined off the offending wordage and cut a slot down into the manhole cover that this new piece would fit into once we got it machined. We did actually look into replacing this and getting a new one cast, but we were quoted about $33,000 US in order to do that, so we politely declined. Now, this is a big manhole cover. I mean, 31 and 13 sixteenths in diameter, uh, 3 and 5 eighths tall, and it weighed somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 500 pounds, about all you could put on a Bridgeport table. To get it level in the x-axis, I had to shim one side, and I just used an indicator, just like you would normally, uh, and then just sort of uh, jacked it up and threw some shims under there and kept trying until it was within a, a couple of thousandths. Once I had the x-axis where I wanted it, I just had a couple of machinist jacks underneath the piece on the y-axis, and I just moved those around until I got it dialed in that way as well. It's been a couple of years since I did this job, but if I remember correctly, I just indicated along those dashed lines and got the letters straight that way. Uh, this wasn't terribly critical. I mean, I was machining all that lettering off. I just needed to make sure that I wasn't going to run into any of the other features of the manhole cover. Once I got it as straight as I needed it to be, I just machined off the words and then I plunged down and cut a nice long slot. I'm going to machine a matching tenon on the back of the piece that has the words. And I went ahead and drilled three clearance holes for screws that I'm going to tap into the worded section. As you can see, the section that has the words on it also has draft from when it was cast. That's the, uh, the angled sides, so it can pull out of the sand a little bit easier. My first order of business was to square up each side of the piece so that I could hold it in the vise and cut the tenon on the underside. After squaring up the sides, I squared up each end as well to make finding the edges easier, and I kept the letter spacings the same as they were on the original lettering. I found the edges on each side of the E, and I used that to center the tenon over the lettering. Using the E was convenient for edge finding because it was the only letter on the piece that had flat edges on top and bottom, but it did cause problems later because the lettering was nowhere near straight to the workpiece. I then flipped the piece over and I made sure to keep the same face against the fixed jaw of the vise. This maintained the center that I had found using the letter E. I then found the edges on each side of the piece, and this gave me the center of the piece and the x-axis. This gave me the datums that I needed to cut the tenon and drill and tap all the holes in the workpiece. 
I've got this set up in our ProtoTrack CNC bridge port and it's a conversational machine which made it very easy to write the program to cut the tenon. Whenever I stop in the middle of a project for a lunch break, I always leave future me a little love note just to make sure that he doesn't make any boneheaded mistakes when he starts back up. After going round and round the mulberry bush a few times, I just needed to drill and tap all the holes. And the ProtoTrack makes this very easy too with the position drilled command. Uh, basically you just program in the positions of each hole and you can go through them to spot them and then through them again to drill them and through them one more time to get them all tapped. For the last operation I was gripping on the tenon that I had just cut and I just needed to machine away all that excess material on the side that has the letters. This is where things started getting weird because I found the edges on the E. The lettering was mostly straight, it just wasn't really spaced all that well when they made the pattern. You can see that Equinox is a little bit higher than the other words, and Spring is kind of put in there at just a bit of an angle. Anyway, I just machined away as much of the material as I could. I didn't want to machine down just above the lowercase letters, uh, because that would cut into the tenon, and I didn't want water to leak down into that, uh, that slot and potentially corrode the manhole cover. After rounding over all the sharp corners so it looked a little more organic, I put some epoxy on the tenon so it would seal up the slot, and then I screwed it in from underneath. Of course, it's a lot brighter than the rest of the manhole cover, but with a little bit of weathering and a patina, it should blend right in. This is the manhole cover two years roughly after I did the job, so you can see the patina is well on its way to forming. By the way, do you see those two five-sided bolts up there? Those are security bolts to keep someone from taking out the manhole cover and, and selling it for scrap. The last thing I wanted to put in here was just an update from the previous video. I wanted you guys to see the finished retirement plaque for our water station foreman. Uh, it looks pretty great, I think, and uh, I think he's going to love it. His retirement party's in a week, so hopefully he doesn't watch my videos. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button down below. Please feel free to leave some comments if you've got any questions, or if you want to leave a handy tip yourself. And as always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.